Hello everyone and welcome to the round glass review for the TT Artisan 50mm F1.4. This uh, tilt, I almost forgot the most important part of that title, tilt. This lens is made by DJ Optical for the TT Artisan brand, which uh, as I understand it is owned by Shenzhen Mingjiang Optical Company. It was first marketed, at least it was first available on Amazon in October 2022 and on many, many different websites right now, it's available new still. Typical lens uses for this lens include general use and tilt-based effects, and I'm going to add videography to that, given that both the focus and aperture rings have focusing gear interfaces milled into the rings. For your bottom line up front, this lens is a great concept with a... In some ways it's well executed, and in a lot of ways it has very mediocre execution. In short, it's not convenient as a 50mm lens, and the tilt capabilities are not backed by robust enough hardware. There are also a lot of missed opportunities in the way that this was built, but the most important of them being that the front of the lens should be recessed, and a tripod socket should be built into the lens's front. This modification, which I did with a lens hood, just a generic lens hood and a tripod adapter, and also a zip tie so the thing didn't fall off again, um, allows the tilt function to occur on the camera's sensor plane, which fundamentally changes the nature of and also improves the usability with the tilt action. So if there is one thing you want to do when you buy this, it is buy a lens hood and then a tripod adapter that can fit on that that is large enough to wrap around the lens hood. Your focal length and AOV are 50 millimeters and 45 degrees on full frame, 75 millimeters and 46.8. That does not sound right at all. You know what? I goofed on the uh, diagonal for the APS-C. Anyway, it's narrower than it is on full frame. The aperture range is 1.4 to 16. Element and group count are 7 and 6. Design type is double gauze. Filter size is 62 millimeters, which for a 50 millimeter 1.4 is an incredibly large filter thread. The closest focus is 0.5 meters, which in the U.S. is 1 into 3rd vintage 1970s green hammer tone Stanley thermoses. Oh yes, you can smell that measurement, can't you? The drive type is manual focus only, though it does have videography focus motor gears milled into the focus ring and aperture. The native mounts are Sony E, Fuji X, Nikon Z, Canon RF, Leica L, and Micro Four Thirds. The dimensions are 90 millimeters long and 65 millimeters around for the Sony E with some very minor length variation by mount. And the weight is approximately 452 grams, and that's going to vary slightly by mount as well. Boy, I have a bunch of these here. Holy cow. So let's just, this goes up to K. I think this is the most tips I've ever had for one of these lenses. So let's jump right in. My first tip, if you order this, order a 62 millimeter lens hood and a generic telephoto lens tripod collar to go around it. That's basically like if you have a, a zoom or telephoto lens, They there are third party collars that go around it and have a uh, little foot with a tripod socket milled into it. You want a tripod socket for this that you can put a quick release plate onto the front of the lens which is in front of the the tilt axis because that's going to make this lens's tilt function far more useful. So here are two video clips of this lens with the breathing heads. Okay, The first is of the camera mounted on the tripod and the shift is being done with the way that this lens was built and the front of the lens is what is moving. Now notice that what this does is actually change what is being focused on. It swing, it's the same effect as swinging the camera around. The second clip now is done with the tripod adapter that I made for my lens and the camera shift, then changing the sensor it's shifting the sensor instead of the front of the lens. This is a major usability difference. And in the latter video, what you should have seen is a whole lot of depth of field for f1.4 at 0 0.6 meters of focus. That right there, that example should be enough to explain why this lens should have a tripod socket on the front of it. 
So as it is out of the box, the tilt function on this lens, quite frankly, is a bit gimmicky. It's going to allow for scenes to be made miniature. Yay, woo. And really the reason for that is because the, the way that this lens's entrance pupil is uh, is designed the front. That's the part of it that can tilt. Now, all of this, by the way, assumes that you're using a tripod with the tilt. You can replicate what I showed you in that second video with tilt if you are moving the camera and keeping the entrance pupil stationary by hold, hand holding it. It's, it's just a lot more work. Anyway, adding a, a front tripod socket means that the tilt point can now allow the image media to tilt instead of the front entrance pupil. And that while that might not sound like much, it does produce a wildly different and frankly more usable tilt effect. Also on the subject of tilt, the tilt location of this lens does not appear to be at the no parallax point and tilts with this lens will affect your focus. If you want to tilt this with video, you will need to both tilt your lens and shift your focus point at the same time and rate. Uh, have fun figuring out exactly how to do that. While we're discussing hoods, they are absolutely mandatory with this lens. I used the hood I bought for this 100% of the time that I had this lens on my camera and it still flared and ghosted when light was just outside of the frame. Next up, this lens's minimum focus point is kind of trash and a focus throw to about 0.1 or even 0.2 meters as the minimum focus would be a significant improvement if that is technically feasible. On the subject of lens design, the hardware is not up to the task of securing the lens uh, because of its weight. This is specifically most egregious with the rotational lock on the mounting flange and it is that lock is just way too dainty for this lens. And after just a few uses on mine, the rotational lock tends to either slip out of place or maybe the front of it has been worn off just a little bit because that lock does not do an effective job of holding my lens in place so that it doesn't rotate. Now the tilt lock is also a hair under engineered. And now with mine, when I use it to lock the lens, I have to somewhat over tighten the lock knob to get the lens to lock. And that means unlocking the lens is more complicated. So there are some opportunities that could have been had for more robust hardware than was used. So just be careful with the hardware because the quality of it is a bit of a letdown in those two cases. Related to tilt, the lens introduces vignette on full frame as it reaches the far angles of its tilt capability. This appears to be mechanical vignetting from the lens housing, and there's simply no way that I can think of to have that designed out, shy of making a lens which is substantially wider in diameter. So if you plan to shoot this lens at full tilt on full frame, also plan to crop to five by seven and ditch one side of your images unless you want to embrace that vignetting which comes in on the side of the photo. Now here's a sentence you'll likely never hear me say again. This lens focuses past infinity, but not far enough. The tip about this is that you will be unable to use tilt past about the halfway mark with infinity focus at wider apertures. As this lens tilts, unless the tilt is conjugated to the no nodal point, the focus will shift. So this, by the way, is verifiable proof that the lens's tilt mechanism is not at the no parallax point. What all of this means is that at full angle tilts, you're going to be limited to, su to subjects somewhat shy of infinity too very close, which is good. That's really where tilt should be used with this lens, I think, because this lens can't focus to infinity at full tilt. Now, relatedly, because the infinity focus point isn't correct, just so you know, as always, the focusing scales printed on this lens are completely useless. They shouldn't even be using the ink to put them on there. In related incorrect marking news, that will shock absolutely no one. The aperture markings are also off. At f1.4, in full sun, on the Sony a7 IV, at 50 ISO, the camera metered 13200, which is approximately correct. So we'll give them 1.4 there. However, at the marked f16, the a7 IV metered 1 13th, 
which would be the expected exposure time for an aperture of f32. So either the aperture markings are way off as this lens stops down, or the lens has a shockingly bad T value through its center. I think it's the former. Sticking with the aperture and, and backing up the assertion that the markings are way off, the diffraction induced softness at the small apertures is some of the worst I've seen on a 50 millimeter lens, period and end of story. I found myself not moving much past the marked F8 because that was about as small as I could set the aperture and also like the image results in terms of sharpness and color. Wait, why color? Well, my next point is that on this lens, the color cast changes as the lens stops down. Wide open, the images are very warm. Stop down, they look like they've been lit by a xenon flash with a camera set to daylight white balance. The images are blue. Da, ba, di, da, ba, di. Switching gears to the lens's interface, do you see what I did there, by the way? The gears do indicate an intent with this lens to be used for video, a theory further backed by the stepless aperture. But the rings are a bit uncomfortable for the fingers when shooting with manual focus for still use, and also the gear feel can be a bit weird to use on the fly. So, a quick focus handle for both the aperture and focusing rings may be a worthwhile investment if you plan to do a lot of manual focus use with this lens. My next tip, just kidding, that's already a super long list, I don't have any more. Let's go on to the bokeh analysis. This video shows the camera mounted on a tripod and the tilt being performed by the lens. This shows how the test chart and optical flaw profile changes as the lens tilts. This is all to be expected, by the way. It's just an interesting phenomenon. It definitely does not happen in this exact same way with large format lenses when they tilt and the tilt axes are placed properly. Uh, these two still images may provide a clear picture of the differences at each end of the tilt range and how the effect is evenly dispersed within this lens, which does, by the way, indicate a good quality of milling and assembly with the tilt mechanism, as well as a good quality of engineering with the tilt mechanism in this lens's design. On the test chart I created from the Lonely Planet chart design, the lens exhibits almost perfect center point performance with coma starting to creep in almost immediately, which is to say less than 8% of the distance from the image center to the periphery. Coma worsens for a bit until about 66% of the distance to the image periphery from the center, and that's when tangential astigmatism begins to become apparent and have an effect on how the coma smears form. By the corners, the corner points show strong pairings of coma and astigmatism, which explain the propensity of this lens to exhibit some mild swirl with point source lights along the image perimeter in very select and somewhat uncommon real world settings. This is not a swirly blur lens to be clear, but there are some artifacts of that in limited cases. The Boca Balls test shots here show that when this lens is focused at infinity with close up lights, there is some cat eye effect that is due to mechanical vignetting because the shape of the periphery cat's eyes change unevenly as the aperture steps down. If they didn't change, then it would just be a matter of projection. Changing focus to the closest point with some lights beyond that point, this lens exhibits a curious spherical aberration fingerprint. The balls have slightly brighter perimeters and slightly brighter cores. You know, I'm, I'm struggling to think if I've seen this on a lens before, this exact performance, and I don't think I have. The perimeters appear to have a very slight overcorrection, and the cores also indicate that there's also a very slight undercorrection. <laughs> they should really balance each other out. Overall, it looks like this lens was engineered to have highly corrected spherical aberration, and honestly, it's pretty darn close to what would be like almost perfectly corrected. I think this specific test and the way I do it, black background, point source lights, it is a really hard test and kind of unfair. Uh, so it does highlight, and it's designed to be that way, by the way, to highlight where things go wrong. What that means for this lens is, in my view, the spherical aberration correction is really, really darn good. 
This is a pretty typical double gauze design. Double gauze lens design is the most common, most well studied in the SLR space. An exceptional double gauze lens in the 50mm class should be something that can be designed today with few to no issues. This lens is sharp, and it has stunning color transmission and accuracy. I mean, absolutely stunning by that, by the way. In fact, this lens is the single best that I've used to photograph Steinbeck because it brings out some tonal variation in his fur that no other lens I've used has ever revealed. Specifically, Steinbeck has darker brown rings around his eyes. I had no idea. I've owned this dog for four years before I found that out. But beyond that, this lens delivers in select cases, which we'll talk about later in the video as we keep going, absolutely stunning image quality across various subjects. And a lot of that stems from the way that this optical formula handles light. Breathing is less than I expected, honestly, and that would make sense for a lens intended for video use. Part of it may be that the still samples were taken at f1.4, and at that aperture this lens is very soft and glowy, which could mask some of the breathing. So this first video I'm going to show you was shot at f4 to control some of that glowiness. And what we see is that breathing is still there. I, I would be hesitant to say that it's more amplified at f4 than at f1.4. Now the second video I think is more interesting. I shot this at full tilt on the lens, and that was with the camera on the tripod, to see if tilting affects breathing at all. Now the answer seems to be no, at least in this one sample. Now in theory, however, with tilt used to extend the depth of field by adjusting the focus plane, breathing should be closer to a non-issue if the focus plane can be correctly extended across the focus throw range, and that would either eliminate or at least reduce the amount of focus needed, which would therefore reduce breathing. I did try to do that. Getting that to, to line up perfectly so that it could demonstrate it was a hair beyond my technical skills this close to deadline. The aperture is stepless with a smooth and pleasing to use aperture ring, aside from the gear milling that is. The front element is non-rotating, but does move in and out 6.5 millimeters, which is 13% of the lens focal length. Focus throw is 210 degrees, but that includes the focus slop beyond infinity. The focusing ring is stationary and, as noted before, has a milled focus gear interface. Focus damping is highly pleasing and a very smooth response and motion for both the aperture and focus ring. The focusing ring play is, as noted, exactly zero, and the mechanism for focus responds immediately. The focusing and aperture mechanisms make no noise, which should allow for some on-camera audio use if needed. Sharpness is good. This is not the best 50mm lens on the market in that regard, and far from it, but sharpness and rendering will exceed most people's needs, and the softness and glowiness this lens does introduce wide open can be highly pleasing and make it a strong option for portraits. Build quality is mixed. Take out the tilt mechanism and the build quality is fantastic. The tilt mechanism itself is smooth, but it's also a little bit too loose. And the hardware to lock the lens down for tilt and rotation really are not suitable for long-term lens use and reliability. Contrast and color are superb, and for me, the thing that makes this lens worth owning at all. I constantly love the quality of Im and image character returned from this lens. You know, take this lens design, remove the tilt mechanism, and it would still hold up and be worth owning as a standard 50mm lens. The aperture stars are stunning. When I opened this lens, I saw that the aperture is basically circular. My initial thoughts were, good blurry areas, terrible aperture stars. I was so incredibly wrong on the stars. The 12 aperture blades in this camera create 12 primary and 12 secondary points on the stars for 24 pointed stars that are, quite frankly, the prettiest I've ever seen from any lens. Stars begin to form around f2.5 and peak at f8. They really do diminish from f11 to 16. That's the marked apertures, by the way. So, um, Realistically, I suspect the marked F8 is probably closer to an actual F16, which would explain why the stars peak at that point. 
The out of focus areas are incredible wide open and mediocre to just there past about the marked f5.6. This lens from a sharpness meets blurry area perspective peaks from f2.8 to f4 and really lives well there when it's used at close focus points. Distortion is noticeable in the barrel direction when photographing graph paper. This tells us that the rear cell, the elements behind the aperture, are a bit more powerful than the front cells. Light loss exists and is about equally noticeable in real life versus when photographing a white computer screen at infinity focus. I honestly don't like the way that this lens delivers light loss because of how suddenly it transitions from like a gentle gradient to dark black at the corners. I did like the lens's light loss profile the most from f2.8 to f6, but I would not at any point call it a positive characteristic of this lens's image rendition. Flare is unpleasant and present in strong lights, even with the lens hood. The flare from this lens is a contrast sapping color smear, and I don't see a creative benefit to it. Ghosting exists wide open and stopping down rectifies it. A secondary ghost reflection appears in some settings at smaller apertures. Ghosting was hard to obtain and really not an issue to worry about. Balance with cameras is not great. This is a heavy lens and it will feel heavy even on a heavy camera. My relationship with this lens was mixed. At times I really liked it. Those times being when I saw some of the photos. At others I really disliked it such as when rotating the mount to adjust tilt angle or focusing with the geared grip. And ultimately, when I looked at the images, two categories stood out as those that I liked and found most captivating from this lens, and that's wide open or very barely stopped down with a closer focus and tilted down to about f5.6, the marked f5.6. And that's really the two places where this lens is at its best. The high index lenses do a lot to control the chromatic aberrations and the double gauze design used is good up close with a pleasing character and simply stunning blurry areas. But at infinity focus and stop down really at all, this lens is as unremarkable as a pothole in Chicago in the spring. To me, this lens's strongest individual image quality attribute is the way that it renders color and how the colors look when edited, especially at the wider apertures where this lens skews strongly warm. So to wrap this video, to the engineers who designed this lens, I'd like to list some things about it that could be done better if there were to be a second iteration. 1. Drop the geared focus ring and aperture. Two. Make sure that at full tilt, the lens can still reach infinity. Three, make the tilt a gentler sweep where the degree of tilt is not covered as quickly by the tilt action and also provide a few more degrees of movement. An added benefit to this would be that it would require a larger image circle and hey, that would make the optical design potentially able to be converted to GFX, which would be kind of a unique offering on that format. Number four, add the front tripod socket and recess that front element as far as possible. Five, move the rotation from the lens's mount to the space behind the focusing ring, but in front of the tilt mechanism. The rotation will still have the same effect, but you could use more robust hardware there. Six, see if there's a way to place the tilt axis at the no parallax point. Seven, Lastly, an internal focusing tilt lens would be a drastic usability improvement for both still and video shooters, and if that's not a pipe dream, it would be fantastic to see that become a reality.